Hello everyone, welcome to our final mini lecture on the psychopharmacology unit. This time we're talking about neurotransmitters and neuromodulation. Uh, I'm just calling this one miscellaneous. It's a bunch of stuff that doesn't really fit into the other categories. All right, let's talk about some of the stuff we're fitting into this category. This includes uh, large molecule neurotransmitters like peptides, which are two or more amino acids linked together, which can often act as neuromodulators. A neuromodulator is something that acts like a neurotransmitter, but it's not restricted to the synaptic cleft, so it can act elsewhere. This can diffuse through extracellular fluid and have wide-ranging effects. We'll talk about a couple examples of these neuromodulators in this discussion. One example of this is enkephalin. Enkephalin is an endogenous opioid. Um, an agonist for enkephalin, or uh, the same receptor type that enkephalin normally acts on, is heroin which is an agonist of mu opioid receptors. An antagonist of the, the same receptor type is naloxone. You may know the word uh, or the term naloxone. That is uh, the, the trade name for this is Narcan. It's what's used by first responders uh, to reverse opioid overdoses. Because um, things like heroin are direct agonists, uh, direct antagonists like naloxone are able to outcompete that receptor type. So they can get in there, bind, occupy space, and have no effect on the receptor, and they can actually outcompete the um, opioid that's on board to alleviate and rapidly reverse overdose symptoms. Let's talk a little bit about retrograde messengers. So retrograde messengers are what they sound like. They go backwards. These are lipids and gaseous neurotransmitters that can pass through membranes and cannot be stored in synaptic vesicles. So these aren't, they don't do the normal neurotransmission thing where they are synthesized, packaged into a vesicle, wait for that action potential to come along, bind and release, right? They don't do that. These are instead made on demand and diffuse out. Because of the nature of these things being either gaseous or lipids, they are not contained by the uh, lipid bilayer membrane and can just diffuse out freely. So they're made when they're needed and they just diffuse out. Uh, once they're in the extracellular fluid, they can travel to cells that are in the general vicinity. Typically, these are released from a presynaptic cell uh, and then can travel backwards in a retrograde fashion to have effects on the uh, presynaptic or the postsynaptic neuron. Sorry, I actually said that backwards. They are released by the postsynaptic cell, right? Hence the term retrograde, right? They're released by the postsynaptic cell and travel backwards to affect the presynaptic cell, retrograde messenger. So many of these have functions outside of the central nervous system, such as uh, nitric oxide, um, or they can also function within the central nervous system like our endocannabinoids. So you can see that neurotransmitters typically are released presynaptic to postsynaptic, act at receptors, and produce their intracellular signal. <coughs> However, retrograde messengers are produced in the postsynaptic cell they're not put into a vesicle. They are released and diffused back across this to the presynaptic cell and produce their effects. Speaking of retrograde messengers, let's talk about endocannabinoids. So AEA, also known as anandamide, is a partial agonist of CB1 and CB2 receptors. So CB1 and CB2 are just the subtype of receptor. There's two subtypes for uh, cannabinoids. Partial agonist isn't something we've really talked about. Don't worry too much about that. It just it activates the receptor to a lesser degree than a full agonist would. There also exists 2-AG. 2-AG is a full agonist of CB1 and CB2 receptors. It's present in higher levels. This is the more common signaling mechanism. These are synthesized in response to the polarization of the postsynaptic cell, um, typically in response to an influx of calcium. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that those endocannabinoids are synthesized and released immediately in response to cellular signaling. So they're able to sort of be generated and travel back across the synapse. So mostly what we're talking about here is an endocannabinoid being synthesized in the postsynaptic cell, traveling in a retrograde fashion and binding to a receptor on the presynaptic cell, producing its effects, typically inhibitory effects, right? Um, it's also possible for non-retrograde signaling to take place in which the endocannabinoid actually sort of makes a lateral move and is able to impact receptors that are located on that releasing postsynaptic neuron. Uh, but most of the time, we're going to be talking about endocannabinoids 
as a retrograde signaler that are going to come back and have an inhibitory effect on release. So endocannabinoids traveling backwards bind to a cannabinoid receptor. Here it's a CB1 receptor that's going to produce inhibition of vesicular release. So as far as endocannabinoid or drugs that work on the cannabinoid system, uh, we have the agonist THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, which maybe you've heard of. Uh, there exist antagonists for cannabinoid receptors as well, um, including Romanovant, which is used uh, in research, not used uh, recreationally. And uh, again, these are called cannabinoid receptors because we have an endocannabinoid system, right? Our body naturally produces cannabinoids that are an important part of how our cells work on a normal basis. Um, we do not have receptors that exist for the sole purpose of, of uh, THC. Uh, THC does work on those receptors. They're called cannabinoid receptors because that's sort of the way that they were discovered. But uh, endocannabinoids do in fact exist and our, our brain uses them as part of daily regular operation. All right, let's talk about the soluble gas, nitric oxide. Not to be confused with nitrous oxide, the thing that Vin Diesel uses to make his cars go fast. Nitric oxide is gas produced by cells in our nervous system. Uh, one of the effects of the signaling cascade is it dilates the blood vessels in the active region. Again, not nitrous oxide, not the thing that makes your car go fast, but nitric oxide. Um, one thing nitric oxide does, it stimulates the production of cyclic GMP. Don't worry too much about that name, but I'm just giving this as an example of a practical effect of nitric oxide signaling. Cyclic GMP is important for um, all kinds of things. One of them is uh, vasodilation. A Viagra, maybe you've heard of this drug, it interferes with the, an enzyme that breaks down cyclic GMP. Uh, which again is that second messenger that's downstream of nitric oxide and prolongs its effect. So basically how Viagra works is it promotes vasodilation, right? It lets those blood vessels that dilate stay dilated longer because um, this cyclic GMP is being allowed to stay active for longer, right? And this is a messenger that's downstream of nitric oxide. So nitric oxide can accomplish this blood vessel dilation through its effect on cyclic GMP, Viagra keeps the cyclic GMP active for longer, promoting longer duration vasodilation. So yeah, there's the answer to the question that you never asked, which is how exactly does Viagra work? Okay, next up, a drug that most of us probably use more often is, um, well, let's talk about um, caffeine and adenosine. So uh, adenosine is a nucleoside. A nucleoside is a compound that consists of a sugar molecule bound with a purine or pyrimidine base. Don't worry too much about that. I'm not going to ask you what constitutes a nucleoside. I just included it in case people were curious. Adenosine is a neuromodulator in our brain. So it is a nucleoside and it is a neuromodulator. It acts a lot like a neurotransmitter. Um, basically, the function that people associate most with adenosine is that it makes us feel um, tired. So um, basically, adenosine accumulates throughout the day, uh, binds to adenosine receptors, and produces sort of a sleepy, tired feeling. Caffeine is a competitive antagonist of adenosine. So caffeine gets in there, and one of the things it does is it binds to those adenosine receptors, but doesn't activate them, right? It's like a key that fits into a lock, but doesn't turn it. Those adenosine receptors can't bind and you don't feel as tired. Caffeine promotes wakefulness. Another interesting thing about this is caffeine produces rapid tolerance, rapid pharmacodynamic tolerance as it happens, where um, the amount of adenosine receptors increases. Um, so you, you might have to increase the amount of coffee that you drink over time to continue feeling awake. This also leads to that really bad withdrawal, right? If any of you are like me and you have coffee pretty much every day, if you ever skip a day of coffee, you feel far more tired than you would if you had uh, never consumed coffee in the first place. Because you have all those adenosine receptors that are suddenly unoccupied by caffeine and there's lots of places for adenosine to bind, so you feel very tired. This goes back to normal, right? Our body has an interest in maintaining homeostasis, so if you stop drinking caffeine for long enough, uh, the amount of adenosine receptors will sort of bounce back to a more normal level. But while you're still in the withdrawal state, it can be pretty rough to try to function. Okay.
That concludes our discussion of psychopharmacology. Uh, I'll see you guys next.